Encyclopedia Arcana Magic Part 1 by Bellador del Goldenstein. There is probably no natural phenomenon that is as eclectic, fascinating and widely misunderstood as magic. This corpus aims to provide an overview of what is currently known of this innate ability and to disprove some common misconceptions. Chapter 1. Brief History Little has been handed down about how Asatoron, the first Eterna, and the Ash people explain magic. What is known is that Asatoron considered the higher prevalence of magic talent among Eterna. Evidence of the Eterna as an inherently superior race. After Starfall and Asatoron's disappearance, the natives of every continent came up with their own interpretations of magic. These predominantly focused on the roles of a netherworld or gods of nature as the source of magical abilities in humans. The first serious scientific examinations of magic began when the Lightborn came into power. The god Saldrin is regarded as one of the pioneers of the field. This might explain why many renowned arcanists are descendants from Kira, his realm. Since approximately 6000 A, um, consensus exists in the civilised world regarding the way in which magic functions. Some scattered wild mages might still operate under a more primitive understanding of their abilities, but these fringe theories can at the very best be considered outdated in academic circles and ought to be of little interest for the student of magic. Only in wild pathless parts of the world does magic continue to be regarded as a shamanistic supernatural phenomenon. Chapter 2 The Sea of Eventualities To understand the foundation of magic, the student must grasp one fundamental truth. Being and the universe are just one of countless realities. From a universe where the water is red and the sky is green, to one in which neither have ever originated, um, everything imaginable exists simultaneously to our reality. In other words, every possible event and state of reality exists parallel to what we perceive. Every state of reality that is not ours is termed as an eventuality, and the sum of these are the sea of eventualities. Once this is understood, the mechanisms of magic are easily explained. Magical talent is the ability to perceive eventualities adjacent to our own. Magical power allows, us, allows one to bring said eventualities into our reality. For instance, if an elementalist wishes to set fire to a tree, they look into the sea of eventualities for a reality in which the tree, through a chain of improbable coincidences, has burst into flames. Through vast mental exertion, this aspect of the eventuality can subsequently be brought into our world. The talent of a mage determines how easily they can visualise the different eventualities in their mind's eye. Their actual power, which requires year of practice, years of practice to master shapes the ability to make the eventualities come true encyclopedia arcana magic part 2 by balador del goldenstein chapter 1 magical talent magical talent is an inherent trait although its potency can vary greatly between individuals. Approximately one in a hundred humans or starlings hold the potential for magical ability within them. For a Turner, the prevalence is about six in a hundred. The probability of being born with magical talent becomes higher when one of the parents is magically gifted as well, suggesting that this trait can in fact be inherited. Where exactly magical talent is located within the body has yet to be discovered. The currently prevailing hypothesis is one posed by the apothecary and presumes that magic, like our virtues and temper, is stored in our blood. Further information on this topic, it is recommended the student of magic reads the book Human Anatomy by Rosanna Kesselfelder. Magical talent not only differs in strength, but also in the way it reveals itself. This can be a gradual development from the moment of birth or a spontaneous manifestation of power that occurs regardless of age. Some magically gifted individuals even die without their talent ever having surfaced. However, observations have shown that life-threatening situations or liminal experiences like hallucinations through the use of narcotics can encourage its onset. Chapter 2 Arcane Fever 
As spectacular as the possibilities upon discovering magical talent may seem, it should never be forgotten that this trait is also highly dangerous and poses a serious threat to both the mental and physical well-being of the individual. As one's magical talent begins to manifest, it is accompanied by a terrible affliction known as arcane fever. The most common explanation for this condition is that the human mind is unable to cope with the suddenly obtained cl clarity of vision combined with the simultaneous perception of multiple states of reality. If one's talent emerges slowly, the fever will tend to follow a gradual progression as well. If instead there is a rapid, on rapid onset of magical abilities, the fever will develop with equal abruptness. While the affected person will initially complain of nothing more than a mild feeling of weakness and an occasional headache, the symptoms will compound as time progresses. After approximately three moons, the magically gifted individual will begin to lose the ability to distinguish between the various eventualities. If left untreated, this will inevitably lead to complete insanity. Furthermore, as one's hold on reality is slipping, accidental incorporation of other eventualities into our world become increasingly likely. Many wild mages owe their pathlessness to arcane fever. Although the characteristics of insanity may differ from person to person, one out of every five cases will res result in the Blue Death within a year after the fever's onset. The Blue Death owes its name to the distinctive deformation of the body of the afflicted, which culminates in the transformation into an outrageous, unpredictable beast known as an Orbaya. Encyclopedia Arcana Magic Part 3, written by Balador Dal Goldenstein. Chapter 1 The Subduement of Magic. Considering how devastating the consequences of untreated arcane fever are, no sane mages would remain if there were no means to combat it. As it is, various methods exist for, safe, for safely gaining control of and furthering developing one magical's talents. one's magical talents. Although the approaches may differ in nature and execution, the goal is the same, to only glance at the sea of eventualities when desired. The most common and safest ritual is practiced in the civilized world and revolves around achieving control through meditation and reflection. Here in Enderal, this ritual is known as the journey to the water, and everyone who finds themselves with the awakened magical talent is required to successfully complete it at the Holy Order, regardless of status and means. The journey to the water lasts one year and consists of education about the functionality of magic as well as daily, hour-long meditation and prayer. In addition, periods of, ab periods of abstinence are required to improve both physical and metaphysical awareness. At the end of the year, the acolyte of magic has to prove that they have mastered their aptitude and are no longer in danger of being overwhelmed by the sight into the sea of eventualities. Afterwards, they are free to return to their former lives on the path. As mentioned previously, more approaches to suppress arcane fever are known, but the student of magic is strongly advised against engaging in them. These alternative rituals rely on entrop entropic magic and pose an immediate danger to the ritualist as well as the subject. Regardless of experience and level of skill, no arcanist ever becomes fully immune to arcane fever. Casting highly taxing spells, especially light magic from the school of thaumaturgy, will trigger the fever and cause it to rise. Should the mage not cease the fever inducing spell in time, they may well push their mind into insanity and risk the blue death. Proximity to sites or objects with a strong magical aura can similarly fuel arcane fever. Because the cause of arcane fever in these situations is unrelated to insufficient control of one's glance into the sea of eventualities, it cannot be lowered by the means employed during the journey of water. Instead, practicing arcanists currently remain dependent on an al alchemical concoction called ambrosia to keep their arcane fever at a safe, manageable level. Any student intending to try their hand at spells requiring intense concentration or wishing to travel to more remote areas would be wise to keep a few of these potions in reserve. Chapter 2 Development 
How magical talent develops after its subduement varies from person to person, just as the ability to glance into the sea of eventualities comes to be in a ver variety of manners. Some arcanists may never, regardless of their dedicated school, exceed the level of simple magical parlor tricks, while others may become respected arcanists in only a few years' time. The form of magic a gifted individual has an aptitude for is equally diverse. Some may develop an extraordinary focus and astuteness, others learn to wield the power of the elements. Becoming a successful arcanist requires dedicated meditation, virtue and an aspect often neglected knowledge of oneself. Learning one's deepest desires, ambitions and motivations is as crucial for the mastery of magic as controlling the glance into the sea of eventualities. The history of Veen is rife with tales of arcanists who, out of suppressed unconscious need, allowed eventualities to enter our world, which brought tragedy, tragedy and destruction upon themselves as well as others. Encyclopedia Arcana Magic Part 4, written by Balador Dal Goldenstein. Cultural Stance on Magic even in the civilised world, the stance on magic varies greatly between countries. This is primarily due to two causes, the varying ideals of the gods themselves and the native cultures before their lands were conquered by the Lightborn. 1. Enderal In Enderal, every mage has to report their talent to the Holy Order upon discovering an, uh, discovery and undergo the journey of the water. Refusing to do so renders one a wild mage in the eyes of the law and therefore a pathless criminal. After completing the journey to the water, the mage's name will be added to a register and their status elevated to Arcanist. Skilled Arcanists, especially those who take on the Novitate and join the Holy Order, are highly regarded, although they often face distrust and fear as well. According to the 101 Holy Verses, 101 Holy Verses, magical talent is not in opposition to the Holy Path assigned to an individual. If, for example, a farmer discovers magical talent within himself, he is still expected to continue on the manufacturer's path upon completion of the journey to the water. Magical talent is thus to be understood as a challenge which must be conquered. Chapter 2 in Other Lands In Nerum and Azariel, Arazil, the approach to magic is very similar to the Endralian way at least in the civilised parts. Kira and Kile have fewer regulations surrounding magic. There, the magically gifted can join so-called mage circles, consortia of arcanists offering their services as mercenaries and researchers. These circles represent very progress-orientated and pragmatic ideals, which is why many notable arcanists and researchers of Veen originate from them. Although a free-spirited individual may find these thoughts appealing, it is an open secret um, that certain circles, especially the Sib Sibintosa, also offer their services for more unscrupulous research purposes. For further information, the student of magic is recommended to read the work The Sibintosa Facts and Speculation from the same author. And that's the sigil of the Sibintosa. The lands of the wild handled magic, as one would expect, in a primitive and almost pitiful manner. They attribute their magical talents to non-existent idols or the voices of the dead and practice shamanistic rituals. For this reason, they will not be elaborated on further in this tome. Librarian's note. Since the death of Eridan and the takeover of Nerim by Chance the Baraton, only the members of Baraton's guard are permitted to use magic. Wild mages, especially a Turner, are pursued and punished with draconian brutality. The root of this persecution is presumably the Chancellor's fear that his power might be challenged. <laughs>